Hi, this is Teresa from Phoenix Gate Crafts, and today is Random Tips About Sock Making Part 2, or whatever the heck I called Part 1, but now Part 2. I'll look it up before I actually have to post. Anyway, so this is a series, I figure about three or so videos where I just go into random tips and tricks that are frequently asked questions with regards to sock making. Let's talk about cuffs. So first question is always, how long should my cuffs be? Um, it isn't really so much that there's a maximum amount they have to be or a certain number of inches. Um, they need to be a minimum of one and a half inches because if any less than about an inch and a half in the cuff has a tendency for it to roll. So regardless of how long the leg is, the cuff needs to be at least an inch and a half. And if you're um, making a bigger sock with a higher stitch count, you're probably going to want closer to two inches of ribbing. Um, but the cool thing is it can be as long as you want. I typically do a two by two rib all the way down the leg. That thing does not flop over. It does not roll. It doesn't do anything. It also, I noticed with ribbing, because it creates a vertical striping illusion, even if you have horizontal color stripes, the vertical stripes actually wind up making your leg look a little bit longer because vertical stripes create a lengthening illusion. Um, and also, if you have a um, ribbing that goes all the way down until you start your toes, that illusion goes all the way down your foot and creates a grip for your sock as well. So if you're having trouble with sock legs that are scrunching down, one way to solve it is to have some kind of rubbing, either one by one or two by two go all the way down the leg. And um, if they're a little bit loose over the foot, having that ribbing going down the instep, so the top of the foot as well. Um, ribbing pulls in, one by one ribbing pulls in a little bit, two by two ribbing pulls in more. So that's why I like two by two ribbing. It creates more of a corrugation um, that pulls in a little bit more. And the cool thing is with that stretch, it'll um, the sock will form around your foot a little bit better, creating a better fit, as well as that lengthening vertical stripe illusion. That being said, so typically we see the leg of the sock as the cuff and then the leg. Whether you're doing a special cuff and then a leg or just doing ribbing all the way down, um, you might want to know how long to make the leg of your sock. So again, you need at least an inch and a half just so that everything stays up where it's supposed to be, but the leg doesn't have to be that long. Um, a general guideline is however long you're making the foot is about how long you want to make the leg. Um, most feet are about 9, 10 inches in length for most adult women, maybe 10 to 11 inches in length for most men. Um, so you can make the foot minus the toe and heel about, you know, a, a leg of about seven or eight inches is usually pretty sensible if you want a long leg. I get very bored on knitting the leg, so I pretty much never make it that long. Most of my socks are only about four or five inches and then I start doing a cuff. Um, honestly, my personal favorite is shorties. The shorter the leg, the less time it takes to knit the socks. Also, the less yarn you use. Um, I wear size seven shoes. My feet are nine inches long. Um, with an inch and a half shorty sock, 
I can usually get two pairs of socks out of most 100 gram skeins of sock yarn. So just be aware that you make smaller socks, you get more socks out of your yarn. And if you are on a budget, that's honestly a good thing. How much yarn do you need for contrasting toes, heels, and cuffs? Uh, typically for that, you need about 10 grams per foot if you want to do the full contrast toe, heel, and cuff. If you only want to do a contrast toe, heel, and depending on the toe and the heel pattern that you're using, you might be able to get away with just 10 grams, um, but that's going to be a very close thing. You might very well lose at Yarn Chicken. Just get 20 grams for both just to be safe. Um, the cool thing with contrast toe heels and cuffs though is that you can make them out of scrap yarn. So you can have a contrast toe, a contrast heel, and a contrast cuff that all don't necessarily match each other. So you can really get rid of scraps by doing that if you want. I mentioned sagging leg syndrome earlier. So a couple different things can cause the legs of socks to sag. The first thing is that you are knitting too many stitches or your gauge is too big. So when you're measuring your foot, getting the full foot measurements, you don't just want to measure around the ball of your foot. You also want to measure around the thinnest part of your ankle, um, kind of the right here section on your foot um, above your ankle bones because that's actually going to indicate whether or not you need a different size sock for the ankle portion. So for example, my husband is 10 and a half inches around the ball of his foot, but his ankle is a full inch bigger. That means he actually needs a different stitch count for his ankle. When I do that, I have to make sure that I am getting eight stitches per inch for my pattern for him because I know that I need to add eight stitches to do that increase. So another form of this is also if you're not meeting gauge. So if a pattern requires a certain gauge, it can be eight, nine, 10, 11, 12 stitches. It really depends on the pattern you're using. If your stitch gauge is fewer stitches, that means your stitches are too big. And that means that if you're meeting that same number of stitches in that section, your socks are going to be too big. So check your gauge if you've got really baggy ankles on, and feet on your socks. You probably need to use a different needle size. So if you've got too few stitches per inch, your needles are too big, you need to get smaller needles. Try your gauge swatch again and see if you need to adjust from there. I know it feels counterintuitive, but socks are one of the things where getting the gauge in the pattern is super important because there is a good chance that they won't fit. Another way to kind of mitigate this is that you do two by two ribbing, as I mentioned before. And if you don't need to scrunch in that much, maybe just do a one by one ribbing down the length or do a patch of ribbing, either across the front, across the back or down both of the sides. Um, so that way you get a little bit more shaping naturally through the ribbing. If reverse stockinette, so basically the inside portion of stockinette stitch still leaves somebody with rubbed and raw heels or toes or some, you know, the side of the bottom of their foot, that is okay. What you can do is for that section, that's the bottom half of the foot, instead of doing stockinette, you wanna do reverse stockinette, which means that for that section of stitches, you want to purl every row. That means all the purl bumps are going to be on the outside of the sock leaving the softer, smoother stockinette right next to the foot. And that'll end some of that sensitivity. 
Now, if they're being sensitive because you're just using a rougher sock yarn, uh, that's a different problem that you can solve by just getting some softer sock yarn. 10% um, cashmere would probably help with that aspect of things. So how long should I knit the foot of my sock if this person's wearing this size shoe? The short answer is nobody knows. The best thing you can do, honestly, is to measure the length of the foot that you are making the socks for if you can. Um, and the way to do this is to have them stand on a piece of paper that is on a solid surface. So a book or the solid kitchen floor, wood floor, tile, laminate, whatever it is. Make sure it's flat and smooth and solid because you do need to have some weight on that because your foot actually spreads a little bit when you've got weight on your foot, which makes your foot bigger than if you're sitting down and gently putting it on top of a piece of paper. So have them put weight and trace around their foot. That way you can get a width measurement. You can also get the length measurement. Put a little dot where their toe is. You'll know how big their how long their toes is, so you'll have a better sense of where to start your toes for their foot. But most importantly, you can actually get an accurate length measurement. If you don't have that, if you only have their shoe size, there are shoe size charts online. I notice that a lot of them tend to be about a quarter inch too big because you want a little bit of extra room in a shoe for your foot. You don't want your toes jammed right into the toe of your shoe. You actually want about a quarter inch or so of space there, about the width of a thumb or so. So what I do is I find one of these charts online and um, for that shoe size, I subtract about a quarter inch. For example, I wear size seven shoe. Pretty much all of the um, charts tell me that I should have a nine and a quarter inch foot length, but I've actually got a nine inch foot length. These charts also say that from my husband's grandmother who wears a size eight, that she should be having a nine and a half inch foot. But when I actually had her measure it, she's nine and a quarter inches in length. So most of these charts, because they're measuring the inside of the shoe, not the actual foot itself, go ahead and subtract about a quarter of an inch. Then you'll want to subtract another about quarter to a half an inch, depending on whether or not you tend to knit longer or shorter. From there, you'll want to subtract the length of the toe which can be an inch and a half to two inches in length, and the heel, which can also be an inch and a half to two inches in length. That is the length of the actual foot section that you want to make. Now, typically, because you're usually starting from the toe or you're starting from the cuff, so you've already done a heel, you don't need to subtract both of those measurements to figure out how long you need to knit the foot before you're going to either do the toe or the heel. So just have to subtract the length of the toe you wanna to do or the length of the heel you want to do. And most toe and heel patterns will let you know typically for how many stitches you're using about how long it's going to be. Can you change stitch count from the foot to the ankle? The short answer is yes, you can have different stitch counts for the foot and for the ankle. And the heel is the perfect place to either add or subtract stitches as you need to. And it really doesn't matter what heel you're doing for this. So if you're doing something that has a gusset, you will either want to make the gusset longer or shorter depending on if you need more or less stitches in the foot. If you need fewer stitches in the foot, you want a longer gusset because you want it to decrease more. And if you need a bigger foot, you just don't want the gusset to go quite as long. Uh, you basically get 
your stitches to your new stitch count and then the rest of the foot can just be the same. So for example, if you're doing a heel flap and gusset and you need a smaller foot, just do one of two things. You can either do a few rounds where you're doing decreases row after row after row really quickly, or you can start your increases or decreases and have them go about an inch longer. So if you're going toe up, you'll want to start the gusset about an inch earlier than you normally would. But if you're doing cuff down, you just keep going for that extra inch or so, those extra about eight rounds, so that way you can get it down to the stitch count that you want for the rest of the foot. If you're doing some form of short row heel, um, like a German short row heel or the FLK heel, um, I find that it's easier to do the heel as normal and do your decrease either directly before or directly after and just do a couple of rounds where you're decreasing on either side of the sock, kind of where the heel kind of does its little whoop, you know how it kind of has that little area where you can see the corner kind of happening from, that's where you want to do it on either side, either directly before or directly after you do the heel, depending on if you need a narrower or a wider heel. So for my husband, for instance, there's a whole inch difference between his leg, which is bigger, and his foot, which is smaller. So what I typically do, because he doesn't have a particularly wide heel, is I will do a decrease round before I get to my FLK heel. And I will decrease, right before I start the heel, I will decrease four stitches around the entire leg. One on each side, one on the front, and one on the back. And I try to do this as invisibly as possible. If I've got a stitch pattern around the front, I will do all four of these across the back of the leg. Then I will do the FLK heel, and then I will do four more decreases afterwards to get down to the correct stitch count. Now, if my husband had a particularly narrow heel, um, I would probably do two decrease rounds, staggering the decreases before I do the heel. Now, if he had a bigger heel where he didn't need a decrease until after the heel, I would do the heel and then I would decrease afterwards where the narrower stitch count is. So it's all a matter of judgment and where you need that decrease to be. So this is a point where getting really good foot measurements, including the around the ankle, around the ball of the foot, the diagonal of the heel, the width of the heel, all of that stuff is very important. I will leave a link to Roxanne Richardson's video on how to measure a foot for socks in the description box so you have an easy reference for that. Piggybacking off of that, if you have particularly high arches, what's a good way to accommodate that? The consensus is actually to do a heel flap and gusset because you can make a heel flap as long as you need to. And if you've got a particularly high arch underneath your foot, so your sock not only has to come here and then kind of come under for this normal arch, you actually have extra material you have to go under and then back up. So you can do a heel flap that actually kind of comes under your foot and then you can turn it and then you can do the length of the gusset that you need for that. And that'll actually create the extra room for your arch without having to actually make your socks longer. Um, if you've got a very flat foot, you probably still want to do a heel flap and gusset, but in this case, you want to make a shorter heel flap. If you've got very narrow heels 
A heel flap is probably not gonna be very good for you. I have very narrow heels and every single pair of socks I have that has a heel flap is way too roomy in the heel and they shift a lot. You're probably going to want something closer to a short row heel. And honestly, the best one I found is the FLK heel. It fits perfectly every time and it is actually surprisingly stretchy. So it does a very good fit for a narrow heel. All right, so I've been recording for about 28 minutes and yes, there's some stuff that I'm gonna cut out so this goes a little smoother. So I think that's enough for today. That's all I can really think of. There's probably gonna be a part three because I can't just, there's always something that comes up. But anyway, I hope this helped you. Good luck with your socks. Happy crafting. Bye.